Hello and welcome to the SAE Tomorrow Today podcast. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's podcast, we're absolutely honored to have Mark Wheeler, co-founder and CTO of DeepMap. Welcome to the podcast, Mark. Thank you, Grayson. Glad to be here. Oh, we're super excited to have you. Growing up, when did you first become interested in technology? You know, my, my parents were both in, involved in the space program, so from an early age, was exposed to that. But uh, computers really came into access around ninth grade or so. Got, got my hands on a few different types of uh, home computers and, and started doing some stuff. Uh, tenth grade, they actually introduced C programming in our high school, which for Mississippi is kind of very early. And yeah, it, it took off from there. Do you remember the type of computer that you got? Uh, my parents got me an Apple II Plus uh, at some point. That was kind of the big deal back then. <laughs> at, at school, they had us working on a PDP-11. Old school. <laughs> oh, it's, it is old school. I remember I had a Packard Bell 486 and then worked worked my way up from there and then taught myself Photoshop. It's amazing how we always have those early memories of like our first computers. Yeah, uh, it was rough back then. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's, it's certainly come a long way, and you've certainly had an incredible career with stops at Leica and Google prior to founding DeepMap. Can you talk about your career journey and what you've learned along the way? I've had some interesting experiences uh, over, the, over the years. I, I think the, the big thing that started me off uh, really was going to grad school at CMU uh, back in 89. Yeah, that was really the top place to study computer vision robotics. They, they had you know, world-class professors in every field, I got to work very closely with three of the pioneers in computer vision, uh, Ikiuchi, Kanade, and Hebert. Yeah, you know, we had everything you could imagine, even back then in the labs. We had LIDARs, some home built. We built other kinds of sensor devices, stereo systems. One of the groups in our lab had a self-driving vehicle, the NAV lab, uh, and I got to ride in that. I, I wasn't in that project, but I, my friends were in that project, and I got to ride in it several times. And, it was it was amazing. Uh, so got got a bunch of uh, good experience and hands on with a lot of things very early. Like for example, we had a three D printer way back then, uh, one of the first ones I believe. And then uh, out of there, I, I got recruited to Apple, and they were building this technology called QuickTime VR at the time, and that was super interesting, very ahead of its time. You know, probably too far ahead of its time. It, it got some publicity and things, but it really n- never got enough momentum behind it. And while I was there, there was a, a lot of turmoil because that was when Steve Jobs came in to kind of recover the company. And so it was pretty difficult times there. A little bit after he came in, I got a very cryptic email from a guy saying, I have something interesting to show you. And I never heard of the guy, had no idea, but I went and <laughs> to find out what he was going to show me. And uh, it wound up being this guy named Ben Kassira out of Arinda. And he, he had this idea of building 3D LIDARs for the architectural industry uh, and construction ind- industry. And he, he told me what he was planning to do. And I was shaking my head like, you're crazy, you know, because I was working on the systems in the labs and I knew what, what they would do and how well they'd work and all this stuff. And, and then uh, he, he told me a little bit more and it sounded more and more interesting. And uh, he really was on to something. This guy was completely out of left field, but he had basically stumbled upon something that actually changed that industry. We were in startup mode for about four years there, building this LiDAR technology, uh, still state of the art, I believe. It could capture pretty much arbitrary resolution at 300 meters, couple millimeter accuracy. So we could digitize like NFL stadiums and things like this. We were used on movie projects and all, all kinds of all kinds of applications. After 9-11, they, they flew us out to capture all the national monuments, the White House, the congressional building and all this, because in their mind, they wanted to be able to reconstruct these things if there was another attack. So we were able to, to do that level of modeling down to millimeters. Uh, and it was a pretty unique experience. Leica bought us in 2001, and that was another very interesting time because now you're like, not a startup, but in a, like a real serious, you know, technology firm that has a very long tradition and very high standards. So I uh, learned a lot there, met a lot of uh, great people. And then after about 
10 years doing that, you know, we had, we had done quite a lot. You know, I, I kept getting pestered by Google every year. I, every year I just hang the phone up or, you know, delete the email. But uh, finally, some, somebody got me to actually like even listen to them. And at the time, Google was like mainly searching ads and it seemed very uninteresting to me uh, based on my background. But uh, they got me in there into an interview and then I, I met quite a few interesting people that were, they were working on things I had no real idea they were working on. And, and that got me in there. In, in Google, I, I was on the, the mapping team and uh, learned everything there is to know about maps, at least the way Google does it. And that was tremendously uh, exciting and interesting. And I was there about 10 years. So you, you're, you're, you go to Google, did you get, and you're, you're, you're deleting emails, you're hanging up phone calls. Did you get one of these, I'm interested to show you something cool emails? Is that, was this history repeating itself? No, uh, Google was a little bit different at the time. I, I think it's a little different now, but back then they were just looking for talent and they didn't have you know, specific you know, expertise they were looking for. They were just looking for people who were generally able to do lots of different things. And so the crazy thing there is I, I thought for sure I would be working on uh, Street View because I had a, a background in all of that stuff. And instead they put me on a, a mapping uh, project. At the time, you know, it was because they needed to staff a certain area because other team members were leaving. So in some sense, yeah, it's all kind of a big cons conspiracy because had had a you know had I been on Street View I would have learned a little bit about mapping but not what I learned you know I didn't intend to learn it and come full circle now like this is exactly what you need to know to do these kind of problems that we're working on today. Did you first meet your co-founder James Wu at Google? No, I didn't. I actually tried to hire him at Leica. Wow. It was 2006. We interviewed him. I liked him. We tried to hire him. He took an offer at Google. I had no idea I'd be sitting next to him a couple of years later. That's incredible because there's some really interesting contrast uh, throughout your life. You grew up, your first computer was an Apple, and then your first real job was at Apple. Oh, I loved, I loved Apple. You know, go, going to Apple was like a dream, but the problem was at the time they were struggling. It, it, was, it was not maybe the heyday of Apple, but the project I worked on there was, uh, you know, still today, I think, you know, I was talking to guys at Google, it's like all these things that you were doing in Street View, very cool things, but we had done them <laughs> at Apple, like in 96, 97. We had uh, cars running around with parabolic cameras and things collecting these. So there was a lot going on, but you know, it was such a sidelight at Apple that uh, it really didn't have a chance to grow much, but it was a great experience. Yeah, and then you had the great experience at CMU when you rode in your first self-driving car. Did that inspire you when you and James were starting Deep Map to take a hard look at what was needed to make a reality? And was it HD Map? Was that kind of your Leica experience meets your CMU experience? So the thing about the CMU experience is back then we were able to do a heck of a lot with very little. Now we have so many things that are much better. Just the sensor quality, like the LiDARs and the cameras we had on that nav lab are terrible compared to what, what they have today. Uh, the com compute capacity. I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm pretty sure, you know, we had racks of computers, not just a rack, like a van full of racks in the back of that thing to drive back in 89, 90, up to 93 or so. A lot of things have improved for the better. Deep learning has come along and, and made some, some aspects of that. Large scale mapping has come a long way. So there, there's a lot of things that are now favorable for solving this. And why do you feel that HD maps are the missing piece of, of the puzzle to solve full self-driving? So in, in the end, all the main players in L4 driving you know, rely pretty heavily on HD maps. And there's, there's a reason. Fundamentally, the car is moving around in real time, having to understand things and make decisions at a very short time period. Understanding goes much more than pattern recognition and things like this. There's gotta be a deeper level of understanding and maps actually provide that. So if you think about all the things that the, the self-driving car has to do in real time, it has to ask a lot of questions about the world. And those answers have to be very, very reliable and precise and answered immediately. 
And there's not a lot of room for guessing if you have a robot that's controlling, you know, basically your life. Uh, it has your life in, in its hands. So uh, HD maps solve a lot of those problems. HD maps can answer those problems in real time. It can answer them very reliably, much more reliably than any perception system could. But the other thing is you can't see everything that you need to know. Often there's things obstructed. Sometimes there's things that are just disappeared. And then there's sensors making mistakes. And then there's perception making mistakes. So maps actually can solve that at, at a much higher level of reliability and safety. The other thing is maps can look around corners. It can look 10 seconds into the future. So all the planning and everything that goes on, it provides a lot of benefits which make self-driving tractable. And that's, that's a big point. If you want to get to a point where you can have the driver, the human driver, take their eyes off or turn, you know, go to sleep, it has to be much more reliable in terms of making the decisions. Uh, otherwise, it just you'll never be able to do that. And how often are these maps updating? The update of maps is a, currently a very big problem. And this is one of the big problems in mapping. In normal Google Maps and uh, other mapping companies, you know, you get updates happening on several month basis to a year basis. So that, that doesn't work. So for for HD maps, it was clear to us that updates was one of the critical problems. And this is one of the things that we designed our approach around. And the uh, conceptually, we feel that the only scalable solution is if the cars that are using the map are also creating and updating the map. So this whole whole idea that you have a, a fleet of mapping vehicles, build the map and then give it to a self-driving car, we don't think really is, is where the solution has to be to, to actually get it to be a large scale solution. It will work in small, small scale like this, but not in large scale. So fundamentally, if you have cars running around that can map and then update the map, the question is, how quickly can you do this? And we can do this in order of minutes. So the goal is to get it down to order seconds where a change is detected and then the map is updated and, and communicated to the world. So that conceptually, if you're driving around in a self-driving car, if there's a change in the road, the first car that comes to that will detect the change and adjust its behavior. But the, the cars coming behind it should not have that problem. They should be just going through as if nothing, you know, they'll know exactly what to do. They, they won't have to like sit and uh, go into fallback behaviors and things like this. That's fascinating. So if there's an individual riding in say the second or third vehicle that's after the map update, that they'll just continue on that journey like there wasn't an obstacle there? Yeah, they'll know where the obstacle is precisely and how to navigate around it. And that, that we support. Wow, and what role does localization play in all of this? So localization is a, a pretty fundamental capability of self-driving. You need to know where you are in the world in order to automatically go between two places. So fundamentally, you, knew, you need to know at some level that. Now, if you think about it, how accurately do you need to know where you are? Well, if you want to actually pull over and drop somebody off, you probably need to know pretty precisely where you can do that. You know, sometimes a, a foot or so off and you're now violating some, some rule or something. So you need to know that pretty precisely. For us, we believe that if you have an accurate map and you wanna be able to use it, you really need to precisely know where you are. And if by precisely know, we mean like within centimeters so that as you're driving around, you know exactly where all these other things and what they mean and what rules are implied by them so that your decisions, you're, you're kind of reducing the things that you have to decide on the fly. The other thing that localization gets you that most people kind of miss is that if you have accurate maps and accurate localization, you now can accurately tell what has changed in the world. And that is what we do. And we, we can use that to accurately and efficiently do change detection. So it's kind of fundamental. Would a change detection be if a, uh, a tree fell in the road or there was an object in the road that it would de detect that? Would that yes. be? Yes, yes. So, so our company offers a lot of levels of service regarding mapping. So different customers use different levels of that. But one thing we do offer is that we can tell you the differences from what's in the map and what's, what's not. Uh, and we can do that in real time. Like 
pretty much instantly. And you reliably can see you know, things like trees in the road uh, and, and know to avoid them. Uh, so yes, this is a big thing that maps add to the equation. You know, all the, all the other cars and pedestrians of the road are clearly visible, especially you know, after you've done this differencing. And you mentioned centimeter a- accuracy. Could you kind of define how accurate an HD map really has to be? Yeah, so when we started, we talked to a lot of the AV efforts and tried to get a gauge on what accuracy they were expecting or needing. And we got, we got any answers from anywhere from five centimeters to 20 centimeters. And, and people were generally talking five centimeter at one standard deviation or 20 centimeters at one standard deviation. And the more we talked with people, you know, the more it became clear that the people who had the most experience were asking for the highest accuracy. We, we kind of set our target towards the highest accuracy. That's fascinating. What is that exact accuracy? Our target is five centimeters at a, uh, one standard deviation. And will that same accuracy as we're seeing a growth of uh, autonomous delivery bots that are growing, will that same way that you produce a map for a passenger autonomous vehicle be the same for an autonomous delivery bot without a without a passenger? So if, if it's on, on the roads, yes. On sidewalks, maybe there's less safety risk on the sidewalks. But then the sidewalks cross roads. So now, now you need to probably be a little careful there as well. The same uh, principles and technology can apply to sidewalks as they do on roads. And, and we've had different projects with different customers in that area as well. Oh, that's fascinating. So you deep map can clearly map a road. It can, uh, for lack of a better term, map a sidewalk or a lane that a de- autonomous delivery bot's going to operate in. Yeah, and in, in fact, some of the self-driving car programs want the sidewalks mapped. Wow. The reason is, uh, as you're driving around in an HD map, one of the things that you get out of it is you know where other traffic may come from. So, in in our HD map, you know every single lane that possibly intersects the lane you're driving in or planning to drive in. So you can, you know, be careful when there's a possible oncoming. But the other thing they want to know is where people tend to to be or where to look out for people. So some people want sidewalks. And so on the map, um, let's say there's a a high traffic coffee shop or a store that you know that has a lot of traffic. You mark that on the map that they know that there's a lot of high foot traffic. No, we, we don't do that, but it, it's something that you could imagine somebody wanting to do. We, we mark like school zones. Uh, so you know you know when you're in a school zone, so you have to obey different rules there. So that that's an example. Toll booth areas are ones that have to be marked uh, so that the car behaves properly there. This is getting really interesting. And recently the senior director for AI at Tesla came out and said that a, a map-based, map-based approach to deploying self-driving cars in mass is non-scalable approach. What are your thoughts? Uh, I'd like him to keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, first thing is uh, what Tesla and Andre in partic- particular has done there is pretty incredible. Uh, and I really like what, what they've done. Uh, but we do have a difference of opinion on where maps and, and LiDAR fit in into self-driving. HD maps are a daunting task, even if you know what you're doing. So let's not cut around that. It's it's a very challenging task. We learned this at Google. James learned this at Apple, doing it again. <laughs> other people have worked at other companies. That we, we all know that it's daunting. And we also kind of understand why people would want to avoid having to depend on them. Like if you could avoid depending on something that's very hard, yeah, great. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can avoid them. And and frankly, if it weren't daunting, we probably have no reason to start the company because somebody would have done this already. And then we'd already probably have many more autonomous vehicles on the road. But because it is daunting and because we, we think we have a, a fairly unique background and perspective on how to solve this. This is why we started the company. And you're, you're doing a great thing. And there's a clear conscience across the majority of the industry that that really high, super precise maps with, with really great real-time localization are needed. That just seems to be a general consensus across the board from the majority of the, the companies that are getting ready to deploy self-driving cars and trucks. You publicly said HD mapping is less about mapping, but more about scalable infrastructure. Could you talk about that statement? So the mapping part is 
is hard enough, but the, the problem is you, once you figure that out, you have to go beyond and, and manage this at a, a very uh, large scale. You know, the world is large. Uh, we're talking about mapping to five centimeters the world. So this is an extremely large amount of data. So how we manage that and how we build processes to, to do this efficiently and economically. You know, the other thing we have to get back to is if you can't do all of this economically enough, you don't have AVs don't have a place in the world because if they're not uh, if they're not safer than humans and cheaper, you know, maybe if they're safer than humans and cost the same amount, maybe there's a, a role to play there. But generally, they're probably not going to take off in a big way until they're cheaper than the, having human drivers. You're right about the economics and you're, you're right about the safety because in your brilliant safety in the self-driving era, you talked about distracted driving, which was I was really proud to see that you point that out with the IHS data about how consumers are getting in more and more crashes because they're distracted looking at their phones. And it seems that if you take a self-driving car, you combine it with a really great HD map with super precise lo localization, that it will be a safer mode of transport. And you also said in your paper, which was really smart, taking a child to school. Yeah. And it just seems that you're laying the, the ground, we still have a long way to go, but you're doing this great job laying the, the, the groundwork to get there. Yeah, we, we think it has a pretty important part to play. Uh, you know, safety is something that I, I, I kind of fear that the AV industry is possibly paralyzed by the safety aspect. You know, they have these functional safety standards and their goal is to achieve, you know, one fatal accident caused by a, a problem in the system every 300 billion miles. So that's a, a very hard standard to prove. So everybody's saying, oh, how am I ever, ever going to prove that? You know, it'll take forever to drive a billion miles, let alone 300 billion. But in, in, in that paper, I, I kind of stepped back and looked, looked at it a little bit differently. I generally think that with the right sensors and system and HD map and things like this, you, you can probably get to the point that it's rare for a crash to be caused by the AV. You know, uh, Mobileye has put out some some works uh, some work on in this area in terms of managing safety envelopes around the car. You know, if the sensors are picking up all these obstacles moving around you much more frequently and accurately than a human, uh, you can start to get to the point where you can pretty much avoid a collision. So, if you can prove that you can avoid a collision in twenty million miles or one in twenty million miles. Now you have a level of safety that's like 10 times better or more than human, reduces fatalities a huge amount and injury accidents a huge amount, and then practically eliminates collisions as we know it. And, and then proving 20 million is, is uh, not so, you know, it's challenging, but it's not a billion. Yeah, and, and it's a great problem to solve because if we think about how many Positive, how many lives are going to be saved and the positive impact that will be on those families. Right. On a previous podcast, we had uh, Dr. Mark Rosekind, uh, now now with Zooks, but we talked about when he was at NHTSA, and we talked about when there there was a crash, and if it was involved a, a public figure, a celebrity, it was all over the news. And I said to Mark, I said, but the individual that was involved in that, that crash, if it's fatal, was a celebrity to their family, and, they, and, and this kind of passes away like it's no problem. So... It's really great that, that you're trying to put these standards there to, to help save lives and help improve mobility. So I, I, I kind of have a slightly different take on, you know, self-driving has the chance to save a huge amount of time. If you consider the amount of time spent, if you're in even a minor collision, that is a major impact to you. They happen very frequently. This is not a, you know, one in a, a million kind of thing. It's you know, much more frequent than that. Uh, it's traumatic. You know, some people can't sleep, you know, forever after having an accident. Some people, you know, they have whiplash and things like this. My, my mom, for example. I think a lot of people have just been focused on the fatalities, but the impact on time saving uh, just from reducing the number of collisions is a a uh, huge amount and the savings go on beyond that, I think. And you're right, because you, you talk about the, the human stress level. That go, even if it's a little fender bender, you're stressed out, you got to deal with the insurance and you have to go through all this stuff. That's right. If you're if you're even in a near accident, like 
every every couple of months something happens where it's like oh you slam on the brakes and you are for quite a while kind of traumatized even though you didn't hit anything you're you're kind of a wreck and it affects you more throughout the week and you know so all of these things are, are things that can be improved you're 100 percent right and as you try to improve this through um, HD maps, how accurate does localization have to be? Think about it this way. When you localize to the map, it basically sets you in reference to the map. And so everything around you is measured relative to that. So if you have a five centimeter map and a one meter localization, you're not, you're not in probably very good shape. Uh, even 50 centimeters off going in a direction could greatly impact your planning and control for deciding how to bank and turn or uh, accelerate or decelerate. So in our mind, our, our aim is to get it also in the five centimeter range. And for and for most for most operating domains, we are in that range. Are you able to publicly talk about where some of your maps are deployed in, in, in geographical regions with leaving companies removed? So I can't give you super specifics, but I can say we're, we've mapped in eight countries. And we don't even need to go there to map. So we've mapped in many countries we've never been to. How? Our customer. Our customer has a self-driving car. They drive their car, car around, send us the data, we map. Wow. Send them the map back, back. There's no more the days of having to send a, it's called a mapping vehicle to customer X in right. X region. We do have the capability to send a, a suitcase to people and they can put it on a car and map. We're able to send a, send a suitcase to somebody who's never even heard of a self-driving car. They can put it on a car and map within a day. So for example, if they have, uh, they're planning a project and they need to collect data for mapping for simulation and training, they can take one of our, our uh, we call them portable deep mappers and put it on their car and off and, uh, and they're running. And so we, we do that quite a lot. Will you sell me one? Uh, we can talk about it after. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I just like to play with the toys. That's awesome. We might have some uh, project for you. <laughs> oh, awesome. And so is, uh, we'll talk offline, but is this how you plan to massively scale DeepMap through the, the DeepMapper box? Uh, it's, it's an option for us. We, we, we have some plans in place, but we can't really go into details about that. Well, this is incredible because now you're going to have the the ability to scale. And speaking of scaling, Goldman Sachs invested in DeepMap in 2019 as part of your Series B round. What has it been like having Goldman as an investor? So I don't interact with Goldman so much, but James gets uh, financial and marketing advice from them. Uh, I think it's just somebody good to have behind you. I, I think from you know from a public market in, investor when when I saw the press release came out. Um, I called Way and I said, I'm really proud of you guys. This is a big symbol because, as you know, I've known the whole DeepMap team since very, very early on. And I saw the press release. I was like, this is awesome. Like, you've come so far. And I was so proud of, of where you've come from because to me, it was, it was a big positive statement of your, of your technology and where you're planning to go. So congratulations on that. Yeah, I think we've been very, very uh, fortunate with our investment group. Uh, you know, we we have, you know, Excel, A16Z, GSR, and uh, Bosch, NVIDIA is a very important one. Uh, and then a, a few others that are also quite helpful. So we've, we, we have uh, very good investors. You have a, a great team, and I want to stay in the Wayback Machine with you in the early days of DeepMap. You were, your team was so kind. I came up to Palo Alto, and you put me in a mapping vehicle and said, we want to show you this, and you, and you took me around. And I have to say, I was so impressed that the map was picking up speed bumps. There was also a child on a sidewalk uh, with their parents riding a bicycle, and your team was so kind showing me there. Yeah. How is all this possible in, in just in simple terms? Because I went there, I'm like, okay, this is beyond impressive. You know, we we spent a great deal of effort going very deep in all of these problems. You know, so, you know, the AV problem is a huge problem. Uh, mapping by itself is a huge problem. Localization by itself is a huge problem. But since we're focused on the mapping and localization, we're diving very deep on these topics. And I, I think in particular, we've done a very good job of sensor fusion, calibration, 
And then our localization method is a bit unique. There's, there's a feedback loop going here. If you start out with accurate sensor fusion, calibration, create accurate map, now your localization has the chance to be you know, even more efficient and more accurate. It's been several years since you've been here, but we've made a lot of improvements on what you've seen. Maybe five months ago, we had uh, maybe a world expert on the, on the subject come to visit us and write in it. And after he wrote it, he says, I don't know you, how you did it. And this is one of, the, one of the maybe top 10 world experts on this topic. So we've done some things a little differently that, and also we've had a, a deep focus on this. For, for example, when, you know, if, if you just try things that are like out, out there in the public domain, they're capable of doing some things to some level. But when, when we dig into it, we, we find out uh, a lot of even more subtle problems and find solutions for these. And, and that's kind of needed to get this level of accuracy. So remember, we're building these maps out of a very, very kind of uh, simple uh, sensor set. So one of the first things we, we tried to do was to convince ourselves that from the lowest common denominator sensor set that a, a self-driving vehicle might have that we could do this. Yeah, so a single 32-line LiDAR and two two megapixel cameras and a normal GPS IMU. And we we have been able to show that we can build very accurate maps from that. It's 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 something that is pretty a uh, big deal, I think. The other thing is recently we've we've built uh, some in-house capability to to measure our accuracy and we're getting very accurate maps out of this system. Uh, actually, actually more, more accurate than our goal. How is it possible with such, with just a 32 line LiDAR and a two megapixel camera? Because if you look at this from the outside, I gotta think, oh, you got the latest. If, if, if you look at a single, yeah, if you look at a single frame, it doesn't look <laughs> so good. It's like, yeah, what are you gonna do with this? But with enough fusion and, and some other smarts, we can actually get a, a very high resolution map, uh, even with a single pass. For example, how long would it take if you're able to disclose this to map the city, let's say the size of Palo Alto? Is that a multi-month, multi-day? I'd, I'd say it's, yeah, in between there currently. It's not multi-month. Yeah, and that's 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 the area where we're really focused on in, on basically scaling out the solution. We've, we've basically gotten to the point where we're hitting our accuracy targets on localization and mapping. We have a pipeline that, that works. We're now kind of looking at optimizing that. Will it get to the point where the entire world where vehicles operate is mapped? Or will it get to the point where it's just say, it's gonna operate in the San Francisco metro region, the LA metro region, the Las Vegas metro region, it'll be mapped by regions? Or how will this kind of eventually evolve as we look down the line? So it could it could go either way. It depends on who gets there first. If it's the robo taxis, then you'll see the metro regions mapped first. If it's the consumer like L2 Plus that does it first, uh, they will have probably everything mapped. They're they're probably in a tight race. <laughs> you know, probably the L2 Plus guys are aiming to launch right around the time a lot of the robo taxi guys are aiming to launch. So it'll be interesting to see how that how that turns out. It'll be interesting too, is, is where the consumer is going to decide. Are they going to want to have an L2 plus product or are they going to want to go in the robo taxi? And at the end of the day, that's going to be the interesting uh, thing to watch. Right. And speaking of consumers, how is having a non-traditional uh, background outside of automotive help you as you've built DeepMap? Well, uh, for one thing, I think it's clear to most people that software is becoming super important for automotive. So, you know, while, uh, while James and I don't have automotive backgrounds. The software and mapping backgrounds help a lot. Now, when we started, we we knew working in the automotive industry was not a walk in the park. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, there it's challenging. You know, AV companies and the you know OEMs and the tier ones all are you know have a lot of processes and you know budget uh, management kind of uh, issues. So it's 
it's a challenge still. But you you've done great things, and the entire staff has done great things to to overcome those challenges. And as you overcome those challenges, and you continue to build, and you continue to innovate. Where do you see DeepMap as a company in five, 10, 15 years? Five years, I'd like to see us as one of the primary providers of HDMAP solutions. I think in five years, HDMAPs will be out in the world on a, a fairly significant scale. It's still unclear whether they will be in the L2 Plus or the L4, you know, but most of my focus is on getting getting to that goal. 10, 15 years, it's hard to see that far in the future. Frank, frankly, you know, when we started the company, the same challenges exist. The, is, the same opportunities exist. So uh, we're still focused on that. It seems like the opportunities are, are just growing. And I saw the, the press release about the Mercedes Benz uh, Robo Taxi pilot that you provide the map for. And that that's an awesome, great step for you. Do you th- when do you think that these robo taxis uh, will start to sc- will scale in meaningful ways where a consumer can open their iPhone and and hail one? That's still a good question. Uh, I I hear from different prog- programs. You know, they're they're aiming for you know, twenty twenty three to twenty twenty five that range of times. Some of the original estimates were probably twenty twenty one twenty twenty two. That's probably a little early. Although Waymo could possibly announce on, on one day that they're in, you know, fully running in a city. So that wouldn't surprise me too much. It, it seems clear that the robo-taxis are going to happen, though. It's just the question is, who is going to be the main provider here? There's a lot of people trying to you know, ca- catch you know, either all or part of that business. So it's still a significant race. And the, and the first mover there is going to have quite an advantage. It's going to be a little difficult to displace them. Uh, the other option is that L2 Plus eventually evolves into L4 in consumer vehicles. But my guess is uh, robotaxis will beat them to the L4 punch. So the the OEMs will probably still be an L2 Plus uh, level for a while while robotaxis are rolling out. So that'll be a difficult situation, I think. But as far as deep map, we're we're aiming to support, uh, you know, all of those use cases. So that that's kind of uh, out of our hands. Mark, this has been a really interesting conversation. We focused a lot on ground vehicles, especially as it relates to uh, moving passengers. And we really haven't dived into probably the one of the most fastest growing segments uh, of autonomy uh, with driverless trucks. And we saw during the pandemic that driverless trucks were continuing to to haul goods, um, it's essential goods of toilet paper. They're they're moving products for consumer retailers. Is DeepMap starting to get involved in the, the trucking space at all? Yeah, so trucking is a big one. Uh, there's a lot of potential for improvement in, in that market in terms of safety and uh, utilization of trucks. So there's there's a lot going on there. We're, we're currently working with several trucking companies. Truck tr- Trucks is a more complicated problem, but we've worked on our system to be able to accommodate that. So... Our, our map making engine is is able to support different customers' car configurations, but we're also able to support truck configurations as well. Trucks are a little bit more complicated just because uh, generally the relationship between the sensors is not as stable as on a, a normal uh, vehicle. You often have uh, lidars very high in the air on these cabs that are bouncing around, but uh, we've we've done a lot of work with several of these big trucking companies on on evaluating our our mapping and localization on their systems and we have been successful doing that. And so is it just due because when you you have the cab then you have the, the back part of the truck and then it seems some of these configurations they're only in the front part and then some are on the back part. Is that what kind of the different configurations where there's no standardization? So they aren't standard because they're trying to figure out where the best place to mount these sensors are. And, and part of that is an evaluation process with us. Like, in order for you to have a self driving vehicle for all practical purposes, it has to be able to localize and map as well in our mind. So, 
uh, working with our, our customers to figure out where the, the best mounting of the sensors is to make the, the mapping and localization reliable is, is actually a big part of it. And then they have all kinds of constraints on how far they have to perceive potential uh, other cars and things like this. Uh, so there's a lot of complexity in that space. And then, as you mentioned, you have the, the trailer has to also uh, be accounted for. So it's, it's a, a more complicated uh, situation. But there's a huge opportunity there. The HD maps for cars and trucks are roughly the same. It's just making these trucks capable of consuming and creating and updating the maps. Uh, that's, that's what we've helped these companies with. That's really good to hear because if you, if you look at just the general economics around the trucking industry, it just seems like it's growing much faster than the robo-taxi industry, just from investment and, and being able to, to generate revenue. And on the other side of the trucking industry, you have the, the middle mile and last mile. Is that an area that Deep Map's also playing in as it relates to moving goods? Yes, we're working with a, a few of players in the, that spa- or those spaces, actually. Uh, and relative to what else you know, we've, we've developed, you know, the smaller uh, delivery vehicles are very similar uh, to what we would do with a car. So, you know, if you get down to the sidewalk vehicles, though, then you're po- probably talking a very simple sensor set. And our, our system can work with that data as well. If you're, uh, let's just call it a standard common de- delivery van or, or delivery truck that you see in cities around the world, and we talked a lot about in this conversation about localization, and that vehicle's pulling into the dock to deliver the goods. It's, say it's a grocery store, it's delivering milk and eggs. Is that where the localization kind of comes in on your map? You say, okay, here's the loading dock. This is how you you start the process. So you could use it like like that, and probably that's as good as you would be able to do with other means. You know, it, it's possible that they might use other kind of ways to signal to get the docking to be even more accurate possibly. But uh, localization would certainly get you the accuracy needed to do that for trucks and, and the like. Would the deep mapper in a box work for delivery vehicles or do you have to send out a customized uh, deep map vehicle to do this? It depends on how different the the uh, structure of the vehicle is, whether a, a portable deep mapper would be accommodated or not. Uh, we haven't really designed it for, you know, kind of the these other odd vehicles. They're mostly for passenger vehicles right now. Well, we could see you could possibly have evolved. So deep maps working in the autonomous trucking space, the autonomous passenger vehicle space. And we, we talked a little bit about the delivery bot space. Are you working with any sort of upcoming form factor delivery bots that are going to operate on public roads instead of sidewalks? And will that be a different mapping technique than, um, a, a passenger vehicle per se? For all of that, it's pretty much the same for us. We, we have to adapt to different configurations of sensors and different sensors, but that's basically what we've been doing. Uh, we've worked with over 30 different customers. Every single customer has at least one configuration. Many of them have multiple configurations and uh, we're able to adapt uh, our system to use, use those different configurations. And so if you have a pre-existing contractual relationship with say let's call the company acme company and they decide that they want to go into another form factor can you use any of that i don't know if the right term is like a base map if they're going to operate in that same domain yes well yeah there 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 may be some differences between uh the maps depending on the sensors for example you could imagine throwing a, a brand new sensor that nobody's ever heard of onto the car and you're going to lose use that for localization instead now in order to have a map that uses that localization, you have you'd have to have mapped with that sensor on the car. So, up and to some extent, if it's is if it's basically using lidars and cameras, generally they they are compatible. Yep. If you go to use a super high precision lidar, you know, like a, a millimeter lidar instead of a centimeter or five centimeter lidar, then yes, you might want to consider mapping that separately, because there. There won't you won't get the benefit of having that super high accurate device versus a map that was made with a lower accurate device. Is it fair assumption to say that ac- accurate localization is one of the the keys to determining really true safe autonomy? 
again, it's like a, a circle. So if you can't make the map accurate, you probably can't keep it up to date very economically. If you can't localize accurately, you can't keep it up to date uh, economically. So uh, they're, they're kind of intertwined. And to be clear, if you can't keep the map up to date, you don't have anything useful for very, very long. You're doing a great job. And as we look to, look to wrap up this really fascinating conversation, what is one of the one things that you would like the listeners to take away about HD mapping and, and deep map as a whole? Well, I, I'd say that HD map, well, HD maps are one of the, the kind of bottlenecks for L4 to be adopted on a large scale. It, you know, for L4 to reach the safety goals and L4 to scale out geographically. And we've been pretty focused on solving that problem uh, and having a solution available for all the AV players. And we think it's it's fundamental to reaching the safety goals. Mark, this has just been a, a wonderful conversation. I'm really happy to hear that DeepMap is working on autonomous trucks, autonomous passenger vehicles, autonomous delivery bots, because DeepMap is clearly mapping the path towards full autonomy. And thank you for sharing your wonderful insights with us today. Thanks for having me, Grayson. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to SAE's Tomorrow Today podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please kindly rate it, share your feedback, we love comments, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. For more information on SAE and SAE podcasts, be sure to visit sae.org forward slash podcast and follow SAE on social media at SAEINTL on Twitter and Instagram and at SAE International on Facebook and LinkedIn. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.